Pan Am Flight 103 crashed into the town of Lockerbie. He has sanctioned acts of terror in Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. Recognize these pictures by any chance? It's the opening to the American TV series Homeland. It was right in front of my eyes. Anxiety about terrorism is a huge part of its pull. It's fiction, but not far off. We must, and we will, remain vigilant at home and abroad. Not that hard to take the real world happenings in our homeland, our Canada, and be left with that same fear factor. We will not be intimidated. Canada will never be intimidated. This is a message to Canada. Violent jihadism is not just a danger somewhere else. It seeks to harm us here in Canada. There is a lot of tough talk on terror out of Ottawa these days, all seemingly born of the blood spilled on Canada's soil last October. And yes, it's an election year. This matter of keeping Canada safe is about to become a ballot box issue. The Conservatives, at least, seem to think it's a button primed to be pushed. A CBC poll on terrorism found 54% of Canadians say the Harper government is on the right track in managing terrorism, higher than it tested on the economy, jobs, healthcare, or the environment. And one in three Canadians say how parties handle terrorism will be a major driver in how they vote. Expect campaigning on your safety. So clearly it makes political sense for some to talk about terrorism, but how much of a worry should it really be? How much at risk are Canadians? Maybe these questions sound a bit rich coming from someone who's been telling stories of extremists and recruiters from Canada, but the questions are real. How do we know how big the threat really is? RCMP offices in Ottawa. Okay. We'll open it up. And the place where that threat is measured. Have you ever shown this to people before? We've never, to my knowledge, we've, we've never showed this to people. It's a, it's a top secret um, operations centre. And this centre exists at the RCMP offices because they believe the pace and scale of the terror threat has changed rapidly. Have you ever seen the likes of this threat before? No. This is certainly a new dimension. It's the tempo uh, has increased where um, these individuals uh, can react in a very real and uh, fast-paced manner, which has required us to move now to a full-time live National Security Joint Operations Centre. When nosy journalists aren't watching, the work in the room below is all about assessing risk. CISA, CBSA, immigration officials and RCMP officers sharing files and launching undercover operations to track what we term high-risk travelers or foreign fighters. And they work collaboratively to understand where the individuals are intending to travel, where they're returning from, and looking at different ways to mitigating that threat. That means, in part, deciding who on Canadian soil is enough of a threat right now to need surveillance 24 hours a day. That's a move that can require dozens, up to 100 dedicated staffers, just to monitor one person. How many people are now under that 24-7 watch? I, I won't get into numbers. Is the number going up or is the number going down? The number is going up. There are more people you need to watch 24-7 than you had to six months ago, a year ago? Yes. Okay, not a lot of information, but what is clear is that what keeps cops vigilant is knowing it only takes the actions of a few to change everything. Remember Algeria. January 2013. The Inamanas gas plant. An Al-Qaeda-linked group launched an attack. It took dozens of foreign hostages. Norwegians, Japanese, Brits. It murdered 39 of them. 
their names now etched in stone in the desert. A tall, blonde, English-speaking attacker seemed to take the deadly lead. That's him. His image still haunts the survivors. This is the one who is uh, talking on the phone. I, I'll never forget his face. The, I remember him having that sort of flap hanging at the back of his military fatigue. That's actually him. Shocking as it was, it was just so far from Canada's reality until CBC first uncovered that the brutal attacker was Canadian Chris Katsarubis, his partner in murder, his friend Ali Medledge. They'd been high school pals in London, Ontario, just a few years earlier. CBC News is learning more about three high school students in southern Ontario and how they ended up going down such a radical path. The RCMP acknowledged that moment was a wake-up call, that Canada needed to make sure it wasn't exporting terror. Really, it was a wake-up call for us, too, to take the stories of Katsarubis and Medledge and look for links, trends, startling enough to realize they had two friends who'd also been radicalized. What was with London? Yes, that's Damien. Long lost Damien. Then it wasn't just London. There was Damien Claremont from Calgary, who ended up fighting and dying with ISIS. Then we learned of his friends Salman Ashrafi, a suicide bomber, brothers Colin and Greg Gordon, and the threatening Farah Sheerdin. We are coming and we will destroy you, bidnillahi ta'ala. And the realization they all lived in the same Calgary apartment building. Then it wasn't just Calgary. We found a cluster in Edmonton, a cluster in Toronto, in Vancouver, in Montreal, and of course, in Ottawa. A mess of names and faces and assumed names on Twitter and social media. Making sense of it meant we had to make a map. And here it is, our best sense of the Al-Qaeda and ISIS extremists from and in Canada. Clusters in almost every major center. We built this days ago, it's already out of date. Missing some we've just learned about, many we don't know about. In some cases, we only have partial identities and sometimes just monikers on social media, dozens calling themselves al Canadis. On the face of it, it's a bit hard to know what to make of this, of them. But don't think people aren't trying. Niagara Falls and a gathering of those dedicated to finding out what is happening with young Canadians. Jeff Wires tracks extremists and helps police and teachers try to understand the pull. My name is uh, Jeff Wires. I'm Why Syria has attracted more foreign fighters than any other modern conflict. We've never seen a phenomenon like that before. This issue of Canadians joining ISIS, Canadians joining Jabhat al-Nusra, which is in fact an Al-Qaeda designated group, right? Why are Canadians doing that? Why are there more Canadian foreign fighters than there are American? We, are, we have far more foreign fighters leaving from Canada. Well, what's the explanation for that? Good question. At 10 times the population, shouldn't Americans have far more fighters than Canada, not fewer? There's no good explanation. Maybe the American count is way off. But it's the bigger picture that matters more than the details. We pulled Jeff Wires away from his speech to explain. It's not just the Canadians that are in um, the Islamic State. It's the Belgians, it's the Americans, it's the, the Dutch, um, the Germans. Because the one thing that we have with all those people is that if we, we aren't able to identify them, then they obviously have the capacity to travel, right? They can come to Canada, they can come to the U.S., they can fly in airplanes. So there's a strong urgency in terms of identifying all those foreign fighters to try and mitigate our risk. See, I've been trying to think we shouldn't be afraid and you just frighten me. Uh, there's a strong need to be concerned based on what I'm saying. There's a strong need to be concerned. We don't have a lot of females, females there. We've Wires looked at our map, says it's incomplete, missing a whole section of Canadians who have absolutely no affiliation to Islamic extremism. White supremacists, Tamil tigers. The largest organized terrorist group currently active in Canada is a Sikh group. It, it's not an Islamic extremist group. So how do you continue to um, deal with those issues from a 
police in a national security perspective when all of our attention or a majority of our resources are targeting foreign fighters and these high-risk travelers. Yeah. All, all the black are the ones for whom we have partial names. Police are so firm that confronting the specific al-Qaeda, ISIS-type threat is their key priority. They admit they sometimes step away from crimes that affect far more Canadians to deal with the security risk. Any of the other investigations that are considered lower in priority, that's where we'll pull resources from to put on the, uh, the terrorist threat. What would that be? Would that be like fraud or? It could be. It could be uh, a fraud, could be bankruptcy, could be low, lower level uh, criminals. The cold math of these choices doesn't make sense when it's only a minuscule proportion of Canadians who are directly affected by the threat of terrorism. But fear is not rational, and it's the potential for harm that keeps cops and apparently some Canadians awake at night. 66% say in the next five years they anticipate another attack in Canada, similar in size and scope to the attack on Parliament Hill. The biggest concern is for our children. 71% of Canadians say they're worried about youth being radicalized by extremists. That is higher than worries about abuse of prescription drugs, soft drugs, worries about alcoholism, student debt and pregnancy. Again, the math is odd. Those other issues are far more likely to be a problem. But maybe it's the outsized damage that radicalization causes. So your son and three nephews. Three nephews, I'm my son. Hard to shake the memories of broken-hearted Canadian parents who've lost their kids to extremism. Are you okay? Not sure you ever really forget the yeah. face of the horrified Toronto dad who lost his son and nephews. My son, they make brainwash. I bring here to have a peace, good life, better life. I know I wish to die. Is it any wonder parents worry? Those who've been through it consistently say they're surprised how quickly their children changed. It seems to surprise even the police. With the present situation with the high-risk travelers, because the threats are manifesting themselves at an, a rapid rate, some people are, individuals are radicalizing to violence. Could be within months, some could be within days. Within days. No surprise then that it's hard to get a handle on this. We went to New York, to a place that's been through the worst to look for understanding, and found a man who has stared Al-Qaeda in the face. The difference between Al-Qaeda and ISIS is the difference between a blade and a bullet. The end goal is the same, death. Ali Soufan has earned his bluntness. Once an FBI special agent and interrogator, he exposed the mastermind of 9-11, unraveled the Al-Qaeda hierarchy. His knowledge is so classified, the CIA even redacted pages of his book. I mean, what we see here is something we've seen in so many different places around the West. His message for Canada? Careful with only using tough laws and techniques. It doesn't work. Unfortunately, since 9-11, we dealt with the threat tactically, basically arrest operatives who were involved in planning terror attack to, you know, uh, eliminate threats, uh, kill them. Um, we never had a strategy to deal with the ideology itself. And uh, some of our tactics actually played into promoting that ideology. So today, I don't think it's a coincidence that we see every hostage before they become brutally murdered. They put them in orange suits. When you talk about confronting an ideology, just do people sometimes say that's so soft? Well, it's not a it's not an issue of soft. I mean, you have to, you know, carry a stick and a carrot, <laughs> you know, but you don't fight an ideology with a gun. So you have to find the ideology with an ideology. 
is that the man on the left... On Learn the left how to fight the ideology. Soldier. It sounds elegantly simple, but it's so hard and such a long-term effort. Not at all the quick fix politicians love. When we come back, what's the cost of all this fear talk? I'm a Muslim, so that makes me... A target. A group of young Muslim filmmakers try to push for more trust in Canada, more outreach, because right now, they say they don't feel safe at all. And he was like, yeah, I know what your people are doing is wrong. And when he told me what your people are doing, I was like, I can't... I'm sorry. Left unchecked, this terrorist threat can only grow and grow quickly. In a Canada where the conversation about are we safe is really being ramped up in an election year. The problem is the questions are many and the answers few. And in the act of trying to create security, some wonder if we're making Canada less safe. I'm a Muslim. A target. A scapegoat. A group of Canadian filmmakers tried something in downtown Toronto this winter. I'm a Muslim. I'm labeled a terrorist, read one sign. I trust you. Do you trust me? Give me a hug. Then Mustafa Maula stood there waiting to be hugged. Wondered if he would. Cameras rolling. And he was hugged again and again. A little win for human kindness. But kindness didn't initiate the project. Fear and frustration did. I know if I think about it too much, I think about, you know, why is everyone so uh, afraid of me or why is everyone trying to fight me or hate me? If I think about it too much, it's going to drive me to insanity. These so, young Muslims say they felt a change in Canada these last few years. Their parents now telling them to keep their political opinions to themselves. Don't dare speak out against the government. Certainly not on how it handles terrorism. Well, I understand their feeling because they want us to be safe. Because it's, it's a concern for our safety. They are worried that you know they don't want us to get hurt or us to feel you know unsafe when we go to school or when we are at home or anywhere. They just they want they want us to be safe. That's As a woman walking home alone at night is one thing to be scared about. But sometimes the scarf on, it's traumatizing, especially with someone who's dealing with anxiety as well. I'd be looking around, making sure no one's near me. And You don't feel safe wearing your headscarf? I used to wear it. Some changes slow, some swift. The Ottawa shootings, they said, seemed seismic. Ottawa shootings, um, I lost a few friends. There was one person who uh, I was friends with. He's in the army, the Canadian army. And when he said that we're going to go and kill a terrorist and people who are doing this, I, I asked him, what terrorists are you talking about? This is the actions of an, one unstable person. He said, no, this is the actions of ISIS. And, and he was like, yeah, I know what your people are doing is wrong. And when he told me what your people are doing, I was like, I can't. I'm sorry. Listen, this is, that's a hard thing to hear. It is, and it's not fair. It's not fair to judge or stereotype a whole faith or population on the actions of one individual where we all have to suffer because of it. It doesn't sound like the Canada you grew up in. Not at all. Balance. How do you balance keeping people safe and keeping them compassionate? Both are what Canada is about, and both are at risk if what happens next isn't handled right. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Toronto.